ओम भूरभुवस्वतत्सवितूरवरेण्यम भर्गो देवश्वीमह धियो यो न प्रचोदया ओम शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज सेकंड वीडियो ऑन द टॉपिक्स ऑफ सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन एंड इट्स वेरियस मेथड्स this video starts with hints on practical spirituality this discourse was delivered by swami vivekananda at the home of truth los angeles california usa he starts by saying this morning i shall try to present to you some ideas about breathing and other exercises we have been discussing theories so long that now it will be well to have a little of the practical a great many books have been written in india upon this subject just as your people are practical in many things so it seems our people are practical in this line five persons in this country will join their heads together and say we will have a joint stock company and in five hours it is done in india they could not do it in 50 years they are so unpractical in matters like this but mark you if a man starts a system of philosophy however wild its theory may be it will have followers for instance a sect is started to teach that if a man stands on one leg for 12 years day and night he will get salvation there will be hundreds ready to stand on one leg all the suffering will be quietly borne there are people who keep their arms unpressed for unraised for years to gain religious merit i have seen hundreds of them and mind you they are not always ignorant fools but are men who will astonish you with the depth and breadth of their intellect so you see the word practical is also relative we are always making this mistake in judgment in judging others we are always inclined to think that our little mental universe is all that is our ethics our morality our sense of duty our sense of utility are the only things that are worth having the other day when i was going to europe i was passing through marsilis where a bull fight was being held all the englishmen in the steamer were mad with excitement abusing and criticizing the whole thing as cruel when i reached england i heard of a party of prize fighters who had been to paris and were kicked out unceremoniously by the french who thought prize fighting very brutal when i hear these things in various countries i begin to understand the marvelous saying of christ judge not that ye be not judged the more we learn the more we find out how ignorant we are how multiform and multi-sided is this mind of man when i was a boy i used to criticize the ascetic practices of my countrymen 
great preachers in our own land have criticized them the greatest man that was ever born buddha himself criticized them but all the same as i am going older i feel that i have no right to judge sometimes i wish in spite of all their incongruities that i had one fragment of their power to do and suffer often i think that my judgment and my criticism do not proceed from any dislike of torture but from sheer cowardice because i cannot do it i dare not do it then you see that strength power and craze are things which are very peculiar we generally say a crazyus man a brave man a daring man but we must bear in mind that craze or bravery or any other trait does not always characterize the man the same man who would rush to the mouth of a cannon shrinks from the knife of the surgeon and another man who never dares to face a gun will calmly bear a severe surgical operation if need be now in judging others you must always define your terms of craze or greatness the man whom i am criticizing as not good may be wonderfully so in some points in which i am not take another example you often note when people are discussing as to what man and woman can do always the same mistake is made they think they show man at his best because he can fight for instance and undergo tremendous physical exertion and this is pitted against the physical weakness and the non combatic quality of woman this is unjust woman is as courageous as man each is equally good in his or her way what man can bring up a child with such patience endurance and love as the woman can the one who has developed the power of doing the other the power of suffering if woman cannot act neither can man suffer the whole universe is one of perfect balance i do not know but some day we may wake up and find that the mere worm has something which balances our manhood the most wicked person may have some good qualities that i entirely lack i see that every day of my life look at the savage i wish i had such a splendid physique he eats he drinks to his heart's content without knowing perhaps what sickness is while i am suffering every minute how many times would i have been glad to have changed my brain for his body the whole universe is only a wave and a hollow there can be no wave without a hollow balance everywhere you have one thing great your neighbor has another thing great when you are judging man and woman judge them by the standard of their respective greatness one cannot be in the other's shoes the one has no right to say that the other is wicked it is the same old superstition that says if this is done the world will go to ruin but in spite of this the world has not yet come to ruin it was said in this country that if the negroes were freed the country would go to ruin but did it it was also said that if the masses were educated the world would come to ruin but it was only made better several years ago a book came out depicting the worst thing the that could happen to england the writer showed that as workmen's wages were rising english commerce was declining a cry was raised that the workmen in england were 
exorbitant in their demands and that the Germans worked for less wages. A commission was sent over to Germany to investigate this and it reported that the German laborers received higher wages. Why was it so? Because of the education of the masses. Then how about the world going to ruin if the masses are educated? In this India especially we meet old Fauges all over the land. They want to keep everything secret from the masses. These people come to the very satisfying conclusion that they are the cream de la cream of this universe. They believe they cannot be hurt by these dangerous experiments. It is only the masses that can be hurt by them. Now coming back to the practical. The subject of the practical application of psychology has been taken up in India from very early times. About 1400 years before Christ, there flourished in India a great philosopher Patanjali by name. He collected all the facts, evidences and researches in psychology and took advantage of all the experiences accumulated in the past. Remember this world is very old. It was not created only two or three thousand years ago. It is taught here in the West that society began 1800 years ago with the New Testament. Before that there was no society. That may be true with regard to the West but it is not true as regard the whole world. Often while I was lecturing in London a very intellectual and intelligent friend of mine would argue with me and one day after using all his weapons against me he suddenly exclaimed but why did not your races come to England to teach us? I replied because there was no England to come to. Would they preach to the forest? Fifty years ago said Ingersoll to me. You would have been hanged in this country if you had come to preach. You would have been burned alive or you would have been stoned out of the villages. So there is nothing unreasonable in the position that civilization existed 14 years before Christ. It is not yet settled whether civilization has always come from the lower to the higher. The same arguments and proofs that have been brought forward to prove this proposition can also be used to demonstrate that the savage is only a degraded, civilized man. The people of China, for instance, can never believe that civilization sprang from a savage state because the contrary is within their experience. But when you talk of the civilization of America, what you mean is the perpetuity and the growth of your own race. It is very easy to believe that the Hindus who have been declining for 700 years were highly civilized in the past. We cannot prove that it is not so. There is not one single instance of any civilization being spontaneous. There was not a race in the world which became civilized unless another civilized race came and mingled with that race. The origin of civilization must have belonged, so to say, to one or two races who went abroad, spread their ideas and intermingled with other races and thus civilization spread. For practical purposes, let us talk in the language of modern science. But I must ask you to bear in mind that as there is religious superstition, so also there is a superstition in the matter of science. There are priests who take up religious work as their specialty. So also there are priests of physical law, scientists. As soon as a great scientific name like Darwin or Huxley is cited, we follow blindly. It is the fashion of the day. 
99% of what we call scientific knowledge are mere theories and many of them are no better than the old superstitions of ghosts with many heads and hands but with this difference that the latter differentiated man a little from stocks and stones. True science asks us to be cautious. Just as we should be careful with the priest, so we should be with the scientist. Begin with disbelief. Analyze, test, prove everything and then take it. Some of the most current beliefs of modern science have not been proved, even in such a science as mathematics. The vast majority of its theories are only working hypotheses. With the advent of great, greater knowledge, they will be thrown away. In 1400 BC, a great sage made an attempt to arrange, analyze, and generalize upon certain psychological facts. He was followed by many others who took up parts of what he had discovered and made a special study of them. The Hindus alone of all ancient races took up the study of this branch of knowledge in right earnest. I am teaching you now about it, but how many of you will practice it? How many days, how many months will it be before you give it up? You are impractical on this subject. In India, they will persevere for ages and ages. You will be astonished to hear that they have no churches, no common prayers or anything of the kind. But, but they every day still practice the breathings and try to concentrate the mind and that is the chief part of their devotion. These are the main points. Every Hindu must do this. It is the religion of the country. Only each one may have a special method, a special form of breathing, a special form of concentration. And what is one's special method, even one's wife need not know. The father need not know the sons, but they all have to do these. And there is nothing occult about these things. The word occult has no bearing on them. Near the Ganges, thousands and thousands of people may be seen daily sitting on its bank, breathing and concentrating with closed eyes. There may be two reasons that make certain practices impracticable for the generality of mankind. One is the teachers hold that the ordinary people are not fit for them. There may be some truth in this, but it is due to more it is due more to pride. The second is the fear of persecution. A man, for instance, would not like to practice breathing publicly in this country because he would be thought so queer. It is not the fashion here. On the other hand, in India, if a man prayed, give us this day our daily bread, People would laugh at him. Nothing could be more foolish to the Hindu mind than to say, Our Father which art in heaven. The Hindu, when he worships, thinks that God is within himself. According to the yogis, there are three principal nerve currents. One they call the Ida, the other the Pingla, and the middle one the Susumana and all these are inside the spinal column. The Ida and Pingla, the right and the left, are clusters of nerves, while the middle one, the Susmana, is hollow and is not a cluster of nerves. This Susmana is closed, and for the ordinary man is of no use, for he works through the Ida and the Pingla only. Currents are continually going down and coming up through these nerves, carrying odors all over the body through other nerves running to the different organs of the body. It is the regulation and the bringing into rhythm of the Udine Pingla that is the greater object of breathing. But that itself is nothing. It is only so much air taken into the lungs. 
except for purifying the blood it is of no more use there is nothing occult in the air that we take in with our breath and assimilate to purify the blood the action is merely a motion this motion can be reduced to the unit moment we call prana and everywhere all moments are the various manifestations of this prana this prana is electricity it is magnetism it is thrown out by the brain as thought everything is prana it is moving the sun the moon and the stars we say whatever is in this universe has been projected by the vibration of the prana the highest result of vibration is thought if there be any higher we cannot conceive of it the nerves ida and pingala work through the prana it is the prana that is moving every part of the body becoming the different forces give up that old idea that god is something that produces the effect and sits on a throne dispensing justice in the working we become exhausted because we use up so much prana the breathing exercise is called pranayama bring about regulation of the of the breathing rhythmic action of the prana when the prana is working rhythmically everything works properly when the yogis get control over their own bodies if there is any disease in any part they know that the prana is not rhythmic there and they direct the prana to the affected part until the rhythm is reestablished just as you can control the prana in your own body so if you are powerful enough you can control even from here another man's prana in india it is all one there is no break unity is the law physically psy psychically mentally morally metaphysically it is all one life is only a vibration that which vibrates this ocean of ether vibrates you just as in a lake various strata of ice of various degrees of solidity are formed or as in an ocean of vapor there are various degrees of density so is this universe an ocean of matter this is an ocean of ether in which we find the sun moon stars and ourselves in different states of solidity but the continuity is not broken it is the same throughout now when we study metaphysics we come to know the world is one not that the spiritual the material the mental and the world of energies are separate it is all one but seen from different planes of vision when you think of yourself as a body you forget that you are a mind and when you think of yourself as a mind you will forget the body there is only one thing that you are you can see it uh, either as matter or body or you can see it as mind or spirit birth life and death are but old superstitions none was ever born none will ever die one changes one's position that's all i am sorry to see in the west how much they make of death always trying to catch a little life give us life after death give us life they are so happy if anybody tells them that they are going to live afterwards how can i ever doubt such a thing how can i imagine that i am dead try to think of yourself as dead and you will see that you are present to see your own dead body life is such a wonderful reality that you cannot for a moment forget it you may as well doubt that you exist this is the first fact of consciousness i am who can imagine a state of things which never existed 
it is the most self evident of all truths so the idea of immortality is inherent in men how can when discuss a subject that is unimaginable unimaginable why should we want to discuss the pros and cons of a subject that is self evident the whole universe therefore is a unit from whatever standpoint you view it just now to us this universe is a unit of prana and aksha force and matter and mind you like all other basic principles this is also self contradictory for what is force that which moves matter and what is matter that which is moved by force it is a seesaw some of the fundamentals of our reasoning are most curious in spite of our boast of science and knowledge it is a headache without a head as the sanskrit proverb says this state of things has been called maya it has neither existence nor non existence you cannot call it existence because that only exists which is beyond time and space which is self existent yet this world satisfies to a certain degree our idea of existence therefore it has an apparent existence but there is the real existence in and through everything and that reality as it were is caught in the messages of time space and causation there is the real man the infinite the beginningless the endless the ever blessed the ever free he has been caught in the messages of time space and causation so has everything in this world the reality of everything is the same infinite this is not idealism it is not that the world does not exist it has a relative existence and fulfills all its requirements but it has no independent existent existence it exists because of the absolute reality beyond time space and causation i have made long digressions now let us return to our main subject all the automatic movements and all the conscious movements are the working of prana through the nerves now you see it will be a very good thing to have control over the unconscious actions on some other occasion i told you the definition of god and man man is an infinite circle whose circumference is nowhere but the center is located in one spot and god is an infinite circle whose circumference is nowhere but whose center is everywhere he works through all hands sees through all eyes walks on all feet walks on all feet breathes through all bodies lives in all life speaks through every mouth and thinks through every brain man can become like god and acquire control over the whole universe if he multiplies infinitely his center of self consciousness consciousness therefore is the chief thing to understand let us say that here is an infinite line amid darkness we do not see the line but on it there is one luminous point which moves on as it moves along the line it lights up its different parts in succession and all that is left behind becomes dark again our consciousness may well be likened to this luminous point its past experiences have been replaced by the present or have become subconscious we are not aware of their presence in us but there they are unconsciously influencing our body and mind every moment that is now being made without the help of consciousness was previously conscious 
sufficient impetus has been given to it to work of all itself. The great error in all ethical systems without exception has been the failure of teaching the means by which man could refrain from doing evil. All the systems of ethics teach do not steal. Very good. But why does a man steal? Because all stealing, robbing and other evil actions as a rule have become automatic. The systematic robber, thief, liar, unjust man and woman are all these in spite of themselves. It is really a tremendous psychological problem. We should look upon man in the most charitable light. It is not so easy to be good. What are you but mere machines until you are free? Should you be proud because you are good? Certainly not. You are good because you cannot help it. Another is bad because he cannot help it. If you were in his position, who knows what you would have been? The woman in the street or the thief in the jail is the Christ that is being sacrificed that you may be a good man. Such is the law of balance. All the thieves and the murderers, all the unjust, the weakest, the wickedest and the devils, they all are my Christ. I owe a worship to the God Christ and to the demon Christ. That's my doctrine. I cannot help it. My salutation goes to the feet of the good, the saintly, to the feet of the wicked and the devilish. They are all my teachers, all are my spiritual fathers, all are my saviors. I may curse one and yet benefit by his failings. I may bless another and benefit by his good deeds. This is as true as I stand here. I have to sneer at the woman walking the street because society wants it. See, my savior, see whose street walking is the cause of the chastity of the other women. Think of that. Think man and woman of this question in your mind. It is a truth, a bare, bold truth. As I see more of the world, see more of men and women, this conviction grows stronger. Whom shall I blame? Whom shall I praise? Both sides of the shield must be seen. The task before us is vast and first and foremost. We must seek to control the vast mass of sunken thoughts which have become automatic with us. The evil deed is no doubt on the conscious plan, but the cause which produced the evil dead was far beyond in the realms of the unconscious, unseen and therefore more potent. Practical psychology directs first of all its energies in controlling the unconscious and we know that we can do it. Why? Because we know the cause of the unconscious. Is the conscious, the unconscious thoughts are the submerged millions of our old conscious thoughts. Old conscious actions become petrified. We do not look at them, do not know them, have forgotten them. But mind you, if the power of evil is in unconscious, so also is the power of good. We have many things stored in us as in a pocket. We have forgotten them, do not even think of them and there are many of them rotting, becoming positively dangerous. They come forth the unconscious causes which kill humanity. True psychology would therefore try to bring them under the control of the conscious. The great task is to revive the whole man as it were in order to make him the complete master of himself. Even what we call the automatic action of the organs within our bodies such as the liver and company can be made to obey our command. This is the first part of the study, the control of unconscious. The next is to go beyond the conscious. Just as unconscious work is beneath consciousness, 
so there is another work which is above consciousness when this super conscious state is reached man becomes free and divine death becomes immortality weakness becomes infinite power and iron bondage becomes liberty that is the goal the infinite realm of the super conscious so therefore we see now that there must be a two fold work first by the proper working of the ida and the pingala which are the two existing ordinary currents to control the subconscious action and secondly to go beyond even consciousness the book say that the alone is the yogi that alone is the yogi who after long practice in self concentration had attained to this truth the susumna now opens and a current which never before entered into this new passage will find its way into it and gradually ascends to what we call in figurative language the different lotus centers till at last it reaches the brain then the yogi becomes conscious of what he really is god himself everyone without exception everyone of us can attain to this culmination of yoga but it is a terrible task if a person wants to attain to this truth he will have to do something more than to listen to lectures and take a few breathing exercises everything lies in the preparation how long does it take to strike a light only a second but how long it takes to make the candle how long does it take to eat a dinner perhaps half an hour but hours to prepare the food we want to strike the light in a second but we forget that the making of the candle is the chief thing but though it is so hard to reach the goal yet even our smallest attempts are not in vain we know that nothing is lost in the gita arjuna asks krishna those who fail in attaining perfection in yoga in this life are they destroyed like the clouds of summer krishna replies nothing my son is lost in this world whatever one does that remains as one's own and if the fruition of yoga does not come in this life one takes it up again in the next birth otherwise how do you explain the marvelous childhood of jesus buddha and sankara breathing posturing and company are no doubt helps in yoga but they are merely physical the great preparations are mental the first thing necessary is a quiet and peaceful life peaceable life if you want to be a yogi you must be free and place yourself in circumstances where you are alone and free from all anxiety he who desires for a comfortable and nice life and all the same time wants to realize the self is like the fool who wanting it to cross the river caught hold of a crocodile mistaking it for a log of wood seek ye first the kingdom of god and everything shall be added unto you this is the one great duty this is the renunciation live for an ideal and leave no place in the mind for anything else let us put forth all our energies to acquire that which never fails our spiritual perfection if we have true yearning for realization we must struggle and through struggle growth will come we shall make mistakes but they may be angels unaware the greatest help to spiritual life is meditation dhyana in meditation we divest ourselves of all material conditions and feel our divine nature we do not depend upon any external help in meditation the touch of the soul can paint the highest color even in the dingiest places it can cast a fragrance over the vilest thing it can 
make the wicked divine and all the enmity all self selfishness is effaced the less the thought of the body the better for it is the body that drags us down it is attachment identification which makes us miserable that is the secret to think that i am the spirit and not the body and the whole of this universe with all its relations with all its good and all its evil are but as paintings scenes on a canvas of which i am the witness the way to blessedness i shall tell you a story from the vedas tonight the vedas are the sacred scriptures of the hindus and are a vast collection of literature of which the last part is called the vedanta meaning the end of the vedas it deals with the theories contained in them and more especially the philosophy with which we are concerned it is written in archaic sanskrit and you must remember it was written thousands of years ago there was a certain man who wanted to make a big sacrifice in the religion of the hindu sacrifice plays a great part there are various sorts of sacrifices they make altars and pour oblations into the fire and repeat various hymns and so forth and at the end of the sacrifice they make a gift to the brahmins and the brahmanas and the poor each sacrifice has its peculiar gift there was one sacrifice where everything a man possesses had to be given up now this man though rich was miserly and at the same time wanted to get a great name for having made this most difficult sacrifice and when he made this sacrifice instead of giving up everything he had he gave away only his blind lame and old cows that would never m- more give milk but he had a son called nachiketa a bright young boy who observing the poor gifts made by his father and pondering on the demerit de- that was sure to accrue to him thereby resolved to make amends for them by making a gift of himself so he went to his father and said and to whom will you give me the father did not answer the boy and the boy asked a second and a third time when the father got vexed and said the i give unto yama the i give you unto death and the boy went straight to the kingdom of yama yama was not at home so he waited there after three days yama came and said to him o brahmana thou art my guest and thou hast been here for three days without any food i salute thee and in order to repay thee for this terrible i will grant three boons then the boy asked the first boon may my father's anger against me get calm down and the second boon was that he wanted to know about a certain sacrifice and then came the third boon when a man dies the question is what becomes of him some people say he ceases to exist others say that he exists this is the third boon that i want please tell me what the answer is then death answered the gods in ancient times try to unravel the mystery this mystery is so fine that it is hard to know ask for some other boon do not ask this one ask for a long life of a hundred years ask for cattle and horses ask for great kingdoms do not press me to answer this whatever man desires for his enjoyment ask all that and i will fulfill it but do not want to know this secret no sir said the boy man is not to be sacrificed with wealth if wealth were wanted we should get it if we have only seen the we shall also live so long as you rule what decaying mortal living in the world below and possessed of knowledge having gained the company of the 
undecaying and the immortal will delight in long life knowing the nature of the pleasure produced by song and sport. Therefore, tell me this secret about the great hereafter. I do not want anything else. That is what Nachiketa wants, the mystery of death. Then the god of death was pleased. We have been saying in the last two or three lectures that this jnana prepares the mind. So you see here that the first preparation is that a man must desire nothing else but the truth and truth for truth's sake. See how this boy rejected all these gifts which death offered him, possessions, property, wealth, long life and everything he was ready to sacrifice for this one idea, knowledge, only the truth. Thus alone can truth come. The God of death become pleased. Here are two ways, he said, one of enjoyment, the other of blessed, blessedness. These two in various ways draw mankind. He is the sage who of these two takes up that which leads to blessedness and he degenerates who takes up the road to enjoyment. I praise you, Nachiketa, you have not asked for desires. In various ways I tempted you towards the path of enjoyment. You registered them all. You have known that knowledge is much higher than a life of enjoyment. You have understood that the man who lives in ignorance and enjoys is not different from the brute breast. Yet there are many who, though steeped in ignorance in the pride of their hearts, think that they are great sages and go round and round in many crooked ways, like the blind led by the blind. This truth, Nachi Keta, never shines in the heart of those who are like ignorant children deluded by a few world nor the other world. They deny this and the other one and thus again and again come under my control. Many have not even the opportunity to hear about it and many, though hearing, cannot know it because the teacher must be wonderful, so must be unto whom the knowledge is carried. Be wonderful too. If the speaker is a man who is not highly advanced, then even a hundred times heard and a hundred times thought the truth never illumines the soul. Do not disturb your mind by vain arguments. Nachiketa, this truth only becomes effulgent in the heart which has been made poor. He who cannot be seen without the greatest difficulty, he who is hidden, he who has entered the cave of the heart of hearts, the ancient one cannot be seen with the external eyes, seeing whom with the eyes of the soul one gives up both pleasure and pain. He who knows this secret gives up all his vain desires and attains this superfine perception and thus becomes ever blessed. Nachiketa, that is the way to blessedness. He is beyond all virtue, beyond all vice, beyond all duties, beyond all non-duties, beyond all existence, beyond all that is to be. He who knows this, he alone knows. He whom all the Vedas seek, to see whom man undergoes all sorts of assert asceticisms. I will tell you his name. It is Om. This eternal Om is the Brahman. This is the immortal one. He who knows the secret of this, whatever he desires is his. This self of man, Nachiketa, about which you seek to know is never born and never dies. Without beginning ever existing, this ancient one is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. If the slayer thinks that he can slay, and if the slain man thinks he is slain, both are mistaken. For neither can the self kill, nor can it be killed. 
infinitely small than the smaller than the smallest particle infinitely greater than the greatest existence the lord of all lives in the cave of the heart of every being he who has become sinless sees him in all his glory through the mercy of the same lord we find that the mercy of god is one of the causes of god realization sitting he goes far lying he goes everywhere who else but man of purified and subtle understanding are qualified to know the god in whom all conflicting attributes meet without body yet living in the body untouched yet seemingly in contact omni present knowing the atma to be such the says gives up all misery this atman is not to the attained by the study of the vedas nor by the highest intellect nor by much learning whom the atman seeks he gets the atman unto him he discloses his glory he who is continuously doing evil deeds he whose mind is not calm he who cannot meditate he who is always disturbed and fickle he cannot understand and realize this atman he who has entered the cave of the heart this body o nachiketa is the chariot the organs of the senses are the horses the mind is the reins the intellect is the charioteer and the soul is the rider in the chariot when the soul joins himself with the charioteer buddhi or intellect and then through it with the mind the reins and through it again with the organs the horses he said to be the enjoyer he perceives the works he acts he whose mind is not under control and who has no discrimination his senses are not controllable like vicious horses in the hands of a driver but he who has discrimination whose mind is controlled his organs are always controllable like good horses in the hands of a driver he who has discrimination whose mind is always in the way to understand truth who is always pure he receives the truth attaining which there is no rebirth this o nachiketa is very difficult the way is long and it is hard to attain it is only those who have attained the finest perception that can see it that can understand it yet do not be frightened awake be up and doing do not stop till you have reached the goal for the sages say that the task is very difficult like walking on the edge of a razor he who is beyond the senses beyond all touch beyond all form beyond all taste the unchangeable the infinite beyond even intelligence the indestructible knowing him alone we are safe from the jaws of death so far we see that yama describes the goal that is to be attained the first idea that we get is that birth death misery and the various tossings about to which we are subject in the world can only be overcome by knowing that which is real what is real that which never changes the self of man the self behind the universe then again it is said that it is very difficult to know him knowing does not mean simply intellectual assent it means realization again and again we have read that this salvation is to be seen to be perceived we cannot see it with the eyes the perception for it has to become super fine it is gross perception by which the walls and books are perceived but the perception to discern the truth has to be made very fine and that is the whole secret of this knowledge then yama says that one must be very pure that is the way to making the perception super fine and then he goes on to tell us other ways that self existent one is far removed from the organs the organs or instruments see outwards but the self existing one 
the self is seen in words you must remember the qualification that is required the desire to know the self by turning the eyes in words all these beautiful things that we see in nature are very good but that is not the way to see god we must learn how to turn the eyes in words the eagerness of the eyes to see outward should be restricted when you walk in a busy street it is difficult to hear the man speak with whom you are walking because of the noise of the passing carriages he cannot hear you because there is so much noise the mind is going outwards and you cannot hear the man who is next to you in the same way this world around us is making such a noise that it draws the mind outwards how can we see the self this going outwards must be stopped that is what is meant by turning the eyes inwards and then along the glory of the lord within will be seen what is this self we have seen that it is even beyond the intellect we learn from the same upanishad that this self is eternal and omnipresent that you and i self and all of us are omnipresent beings and that the self is changeless now this omnipresent being can be only one there cannot be two beings who are equally omnipresent how could that be there cannot be two things two beings who are infinite and the result is there is really only one self and that you i and the whole universe are but one appearing as many as the one fine one fire entering into the world manifest itself in various ways <coughs> even so that one self the self of all manifest himself in every form but the question is if this self is perfect and pure and the one being of the universe what becomes of it when it goes into the impure body the wicked body the good body and so on how can it remain perfect the one son is the cause of vision in every eye yet it is not touched by the defects in the eyes of any if a man has jaundice he sees everything as yellow the cause of his vision is the sun but his seeing everything as yellow does not touch the sun even so this one being though the self of everyone is not touched by the purities or impurities outside in this world where everything is evanescent he who knows him who never changes in this world of insentiency he who knows the one sentient being in this world of many he who knows this one and sees him in his own soul unto him belongs eternal bliss to none else to none else there the sun shines not nor the stars nor the lightning flashes what to speak of fire he shining everything shines through his light everything becomes effulgent when all the desires that trouble the heart cease then the mortal becomes immortal and here attains brahman when all the crookedness of the heart disappears when all its knots are cut asunder then alone the mortal becomes immortal this is the way may this study bless us may it become food to us may it give us strength may it becomes energy in us may we not hate each other peace unto all this is the line of thought that you will find in the vedanta philosophy we see first that there is a thought entirely different from what you see everywhere else in the world in the oldest parts of the vedas the search was the same as in other books the search was outside in some of the old old books the question was raised what was in the beginning 
when there was neither ought nor not when darkness was covering darkness who created all this so the search began and they began to talk about the angels and devas and all sorts of things and later on we find that they gave it up as hopeless in their day the search was outside and they could find nothing but in later days as we read in the vedas they had to look inside for the self existent one this is the one fundamental idea in the vedas that our search in the stars the nebuli the milky way in the whole of this external universe leads to nothing never solves the problem of life and death the wonderful mechanism inside had to be analyzed and it revealed to them the secret of the universe no star or sun could it could do it man had to be anatomized nor the body but the soul of man in that soul they found the answer what was the answer they found that behind the body behind even the mind there is the self existent one he dies not nor is he born the self existent one is omni present because he has no form that which has no form or shape that which not limited by space or time cannot live in a certain place how can it it is everywhere omni present equally present through all of us what is the soul of man there was one party who held that there is a being god and an infinite number of souls besides who are eternally separate from god in a sense and form and everything this is dualism this is the old old crude idea the answer given by another party was that the soul was a part of the infinite divine existence just as this body is a little world by itself and behind it is the mind or thought and behind there is the individual soul similarly the whole world is a body and the behind that is the universal mind and behind that is the universal soul just as this body is a portion of the universal body so this mind is a portion of the universal mind and the soul of the man a portion of the universal soul this is what is called the vishishta advaita qualified monism now we know that the universal soul is infinite how can infinity have parts how can it be broken up divided it may be very poetic to say that i am a spark of the infinite but it is absurd to the thinking mind what is meant by dividing infinity is it something material that you can part or separate it into pieces infinity can never be divided if that were possible it would be no more infinite what is the conclusion then the answer is that soul which is the universal is you you are not a part but the whole of it you are the whole of god then what are all these varieties we find so many millions of individual souls what are they if the sun reflects upon millions of globules of water in each globule is the form the perfect image of the sun but they are only images and the real sun is only one so this apparent soul that is in every one of us is only the image of god nothing beyond that the real being who is behind is that one god we are all one there as self there is only one in the universe it is in me and you and is only one and that one self has been reflected in all these various bodies as various different selves but we do not know this we think we are separate from each other and separate from him and so long as we think this misery will be in the world this is hallucination then the 
other great source of misery is fear why does one man injure another because he fears he will not have enough enjoyment one man fears that perhaps he will not have enough money and that fear causes him to injure others and rob them how can there be fear if there is only one existence if a thunderbolt falls on my head it was i who was the thunderbolt because i am the only existence if a play comes it is i if a tiger comes it is i if death comes it is i i am both death and life we see that with the idea that there are two in the universe fear comes we have always heard it preached love one another what for that doctrine was preached but the explanation is here why should i love everyone because they and i are one why should i love my brother because he and i are one there is this oneness this solidarity of the whole universe from the lowest worm that crawls under our feet to the highest beings that ever lived all have various bodies but are the one soul through all mouths you eat through all hands you work through all eyes you see you enjoy health in millions of bodies you are suffering from disease in millions of bodies when this idea comes and we realize it see it feel it then will misery cease and fear with it how can i die there is nothing beyond me fear ceases and then alone come perfect happiness and perfect love that universal sympathy universal love universal bliss that never changes raises man above everything it has no reaction and no misery can touch it but this little eating and drinking of the world always brings a reaction the whole cause of it is this dualism and idea that i am separate from the universe separate from god but as soon as we have reached that i am he i am the self of the universe i am eternally blessed eternally free then will come real love fear will vanish and all misery cease i conclude this video at this place next video number 3 will start the power of the mind raj yoga thank you for watching this video namaskar my dear friends thank you